Right back here on the show, Larry Smith with you, uh, Brad Sturdy, Mike Kegley as well as we continue in this. Uh, uh, here we are in December. Um, I mentioned the name Eric Kramer earlier in the show. Um, 10 years in the NFL, uh, someone that, whose career I followed back when he was in college at NC State. Um, you know, I'm a Bear fan, so this is my guy. Uh, we met back in 2004 at a chance meeting at a Sports Illustrated party uh, at the Super Bowl in Houston and kept in touch. And as I mentioned, um, Eric has a new book out that, um, uh, first off, it's good to talk with him again, but really want to talk about this book. And it is called The Ultimate Comeback, Surviving a Suicide Attempt, Conquering Depression, and Living with a Purpose. Um, and this is, again, as I mentioned at the top of the show, an interview that of all the interviews that we've done, I think this is a, a really important one for you to stop and, and spend a few minutes with us. Eric Kramer now joining us. Eric, it's good to see you. Thanks again for your time today. Thank you, Larry. It's great to be here and uh, having a chance to talk to you, talk a little football, and we'll talk a few moments about this book, of course. Yeah, let's you know, and let's 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 start with some of the some of the the fun stuff first, shall we? Because this is pretty sure. deep. It's very important. Um, we as as you and I met each other, our eyes met. And like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> it was because of football, because you were the Bears quarterback uh, right. and had a, you know a very good run there um, with the Bears. And again, as a long-suffering Bear fan, I was ridiculed as a kid in grade schools. I wore a Bears jacket in the time that the Cowboys were big, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, <laughs> do you still watch a lot of football, and and do you watch the the Bears? That's another yeah. question. You ask. Yeah, yeah, I, I I pull for obviously the Bears and the Lions. So I always get asked like, who do you who do you pull for when they when they both play each other? I'm like, both, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a win-win for you it's a good day <laughs> you can't lose that's right so and so i i do i do pay attention to the games i pay attention to uh uh college less college more pro but I, but nc state as you mentioned earlier has a big game tonight in fact very soon against uh uh the rival unc so um uh anyway um so yeah i do pay attention to it it's fun to watch it and uh, I know the the Bears have struggled for these last two three years and twenty if you want to add them all together. <laughs> but um, th- but I personally think that they've got a lot of good players in place. I think Ryan Poles has done a really good job uh, as a general manager. It's the only time in my lifetime where the McCaskey family turned the reins over to a legit, very directed guy. And I think he's done a great job to this point. Um, And I know we share the bears, you know, long suffering, (laughs) (laughs) emotional ups and downs, more downs, but I also played for the lions and conversely their season up until these last couple of weeks has gone really well. And I think, That's the model of the two teams because they've kind of mirrored each other for all these years. Um, I kind of think the Bears are going to are going to step right in line with what the Lions have done. And I know they've they've stubbed their toe, the Lions meeting the last couple of weeks. But uh, if you look at the organization from top to bottom um, and the way they're laid out, the Brad Holmes and the coaching staff and the players, I called up Chris Spielman last year and it was probably i want to say the lions at that time were probably like one and two one and three something like that and i go how is it you guys are looking so good right now he goes this coaching staff is ridiculous nice and and so if you if you have that then over time you your train just keeps going like that yeah and you're going to hit a bump in the road here and there but by and large you're not going to sway very much and so i think that's what You know, the Lions of all teams could now consider themselves one of those teams that forget the record for a moment. From an organizational standpoint, they're pretty damn good. And I think that's that's where the Bears would like to jump into. They like to make it would be a good step, a big step, but that's the one they want to make. Yeah. And I if correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure my research is accurate on this. You remain the only quarterback since the 1957 NFL championship to lead the Lions to a playoff victory. Am I right? Look at, that you, is look at you smiling. That is unfortunately true, Larry, <laughs> but I think that's going to change this year. Uh, I, if I could, there's not a lot in life you can guarantee, but I would guarantee the Lions win a playoff game this year. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right. And listen, w- we all would like to see that. I mean, yeah. I, I don't root for the Lions the way that you do, but I think that, um, you know, uh, 
the people of Detroit are some of the best people ever. I've always enjoyed every time I've been up there, um, you know, for personal or professional reasons. And so I totally agree with you. Uh, I mean, if you if you think Chicago is starved yeah. for a winning team of any kind, yeah, so is Detroit. Yeah, they're, I mean they're like you know next door brothers. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So and getting and to your point, just keep stumbling and kind of unforced errors on the road. You're exactly right. Um, yeah, the the ten year career, and um, I know that you you've mentioned you talk about in, in in the book and and you know shared in other interviews and things that um, you know look everything went well. I mean you were you know undrafted, you fought your way through ten years, uh, made a name for yourself again. Um, made money, did very well, um, and seemed like things were going well. You're leading that. I mean, look, I mean, who among us would not be want to be a, a handsome, retired NFL quarterback who's, um, you know, <laughs> and is financially doing well and just go play golf, do what you want to do, right? I mean, it's kind of where we all would be. Um, but I, I guess I, I kind of would like to, if, you, if we could dive into um, the night in the hotel. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that um, a suicide attempt, and we're all thankful that it failed. Yeah. Uh, can you? Can you? Me, me included. By the yeah, way, you include exactly. So it is. Uh, I mean, if I were Put me at the top of that list. Yeah, we're we're talking virtually, but I would hug yeah. you if I if I were there with you because I am. Um, I'm I'm thankful that it didn't it, it didn't work. Um, I, you don't have to go into too great a detail, but in you know, in your words, just kind of tell us kind of what happened and how you got to that point. So, um, the first time, so I I had dealt with with. Uh, what's known as depression, even as a player, meaning um, back in 1994, um, when I first went from the Lions to the Bears, that was the first team since youth football that had ever come to say, hey, we want you to be the guy. So you mentioned I didn't get recruited. Uh, I didn't get drafted out of college. I didn't get recruited out of high school. So I didn't, right. I didn't play quarterback in high school. In fact, I wanted to. I just kept getting beat out. And then I went to a junior college. And um, in fact, the first year there, they had a guy coming back that had already had a good freshman season. So I did what they call gray shirt. So I went part time. And uh, and then uh, I from NC. So the next year I was a backup at Pierce. And then I finally got my chance to play. We're pretty good. And so that's how I got a chance to go to NC State. But they also recruited, and two other guys went from California, junior college guy. Okay. Um, so there was no nowhere along the way did anyone say, hey, <laughs> clearly you're our guy. So <laughs> when I go to Chicago, the fact that somebody actually did that made me jump up and down in the bed one night after going there. And then literally, like, I can't believe this is happening. And it, it was the second year, I believe, of free agency. Well, the season rolls around, and and I'm starting, and we're, you know, I don't know, three or four games into the season, and I separate a shoulder versus, uh, I think it was uh, Minnesota. And so uh, we're probably, I don't know, it's like a six-week injury, right? So uh, four, four to six weeks, something like that. And so uh, when I was ready to play, I think I played one game and we didn't win. And then I'm back on the bench again. And so now you got, okay, I'm paying to be played or paying to play, but no. So I felt like I wasn't really. So that's the first time I ever came in line with something called depression. And so, and, and, and it kind of comes and it goes in my life back then. Um, And so you're alluding to the fact of my suicide attempt. So that wasn't until 2015. Mm -hmm. And the events leading up to that, um, one of, so my, my wife, my then wife and I were uh, separated. Mm -hmm. And what happened, this is back in, in this, we got separated, I want to say 2010. Um, early 2010. Um, Griffin had been, that was my older son, Griffin had been in um, in his 10th grade year of his high school years, um, went into a drug rehabilitation center, meaning he left school, 
to go to this place called Visions mm -hmm. uh, for, I think it was, I want to say three months, so 90 days. And from there, he went to their outpatient program. So he lived at home, basically to sleep and go to this inpatient program or outpatient, excuse me. And then it was about a year, let's say, you know, 13, 14 months-ish. And I could tell uh, along the way, he went from, thank God you have me here, to at, he could see the finish line coming. And it was like, oh, that was his brainwashing. Hmm. And I said, uh-oh. Okay. So it wasn't long after that uh, that he was now back in school, which okay. he probably shouldn't have been at, and then uh, playing football, which he probably shouldn't have been doing, and um, uh, had an episode where he overdosed, um, heroin overdose, mm. uh, accidental death, nonetheless. Um it was a crushing blow to not just me, but Dylan, who at the time was 13 and in eighth grade, and uh, all those around. Mm -hmm. And I remember that's the saddest period of time, not even just the day itself, but that whole time period was crazy uh, in not a good way. And Prior to that, though, that was in, what, uh, late October, October 30th, 2011. Earlier that year, on Mother's Day, my Dylan and I were um, uh, playing golf with my mom and her then husband. Now, they're both passed away. Um, and afterward, Doug, that was my mom's husband, took Dylan uh back to their house I think and my mom and I stayed and had a little lunch or something and then as I'm walking her to the car she's like oh I'm gonna um I'm getting some tests back tomorrow I said what test oh I just hasn't really I haven't really been feeling all that great was called up the next day and says I've got stage four uterine cancer mm. so there was you know they found an oncologist and there was some ridiculous surgery she had to have where they removed literally parts of two or three organs so she makes it out of there somehow um and then uh sometime after griffin passed away it returned and so she passed away in july 12th of 2012 uh. and then around the time she passed away uh my dad uh, had some untreated esophageal, or no, he untreated acid reflux, which turned into esophageal cancer. Oh. So that was about a three year or so slow yet never ending uh, downturn. And so it just took, a, it was an emotional like uh, toll that was like one body blow after another after another after another and it just felt like everybody was going that way rather than that way mm -hmm. and so i fell into a depression like i've never felt before and uh and i went about doing something that no one ever wants to do uh and and it's i remember someone very close to me now um, saying, talking about this as, as though it was an accident. And I said, no, 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 no. It was very much planned out. How could it be an accident? Then some years went by. And then I, then I got it. Then I'm thinking nobody in their right mind would ever sit down and do that on purpose with a clear head because depression robs you really of your perspective, any perspective. And so you're literally looking at life through a pinhole uh, and sometimes not even that. And so you don't, you lose, you lose everyone else's, you lose your own and everyone else's. 
And so that unfortunately resulted in me heading down a path to want to end my life, getting a gun, going to a hotel, and actually pulling the trigger. I thought I had this whole thing researched out. And so um, nobody's more happy than me that I'm still here. And because of that, Dylan doesn't have to deal with losing a father. And other people don't have to deal with losing a friend or another type of family member. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand when you're in it how for you, your suicide's over for you. Everyone else that knew you and knows you, it's just beginning. And you don't think about those things at yeah. the time. You don't yeah. think about life that way. Yeah. Now I do. And um, and so it was a very dark time. Um, but now it's a very, like, things have gone in such a way, thank you. Thank, Thankfully, for the doctors involved, for family members and friends, and um, I couldn't be happy is not the right word. I couldn't be more connected and satisfied with my life today. Like, this is the most complete and satisfied I've been in my life. Not that I had a bad life before, but I do feel like I have a really good perspective on me on those around me, on life itself, and the things that are happening as a result today of that perspective. Yeah. We're talking with Eric Kramer, the former NFL quarterback. And again, the new book out is The Ultimate Comeback, Surviving a Suicide Attempt, Conquering Depression, and Living with the Purpose. As he mentioned, um, it just came out here um, earlier, uh, just a few weeks ago in, in November. Eric, I want to ask you a difficult question. Um, because I'm a journalist, and there's probably somebody listening to this, um, that is asking the same question. So forgive me in advance um, because there's a chance that none of us have a chance to talk with someone who's experienced what you've experienced. So my question <laughs> very is, good way is, to put that. is it fair? And I, well, I, I want you to know, I mean, this is honestly from the heart. I'm That's not a very well thought, a thought out way to put that. There, yeah. Probably. Well, it, 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 it is. And it's, um, and, and, and here, I guess here's, here's my, I have a couple of questions. And the first one is, um, I remember you you've you talk about that you were in the hotel room, you'd planned this out, you bought the gun for this purpose. Yeah. Um, you had made some phone calls, certain phone calls to say goodbye. Right. Um, you pull the trigger, and then one of the people who you called then calls you. Yeah. You pull the trigger, but you're still conscious enough to answer the phone and tell what was that moment you pull the trigger, you think it's over, but you look up and you're still in the hotel room. Is that so I have no recollection of anything. Okay. Just so you know. Okay. This is stuff that was told to me. Right, right, right. So this is someone I went to high school with who was a um, officer at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, which was literally right down the street from the good night in of all places to pick <laughs> the good night in. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Chris. Apparently, I texted him, and he was in the New Orleans area getting one of his sons kind of set up for college. And his son, his sons went to the same high school Griffin did. Okay. And uh, and so um, he apparently didn't get the text because I think he was, I don't know, out to a movie or something. and saw it and apparently i told him where i was mm -hmm. and what i was going to do which mm -hmm. i have no recollection of doing mm -hmm. but apparently he called um he got so he he called i don't know if he called the paramedics or he called the the um the the, the sheriff's department itself but apparently he and this is a story i got from chris and believe me I, it was hard for me to get this out of him so, okay. Like, okay. What, he's like, why are you asking me about this? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, know. because most don't get a chance to do that. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> right. <laughs> so apparently he called my cell phone and I didn't answer it. So he called the hotel and they rang my room. And apparently I did pick that up. 
So he he heard me kind of gurgling. Yeah. And said, whatever's in your hand, drop it. Yeah. If there's anything in here, something like that. Yeah. And he did hear something, I guess, hit the floor. Okay. And he's like, you know, there's somebody outside your room right now that wants to help you. So apparently I got up and walked down the steps and got in the ambulance. I, I don't remember any of that, but yeah. apparently that's what happened. At what point were you, I'm assuming, you know, and 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 this part of the book I haven't read. I've, I've read some parts of it. I can't wait to sit down and read the entire thing. Mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned, I just, you know, right. a few hours ago said, wait a minute. <laughs> you and I have known each other on the periphery for a long time. Didn't know you had the book about this. Um, at what point did you, um, were you aware that you were still with us and you had survived it? Do you, do you know how many days or weeks that was? I really don't. I don't remember. Um, I remember. I, I think, I don't, I think there was two so hospitals I was in, which I have no recollection of either one of them. Yeah. I, I guess I was at one of the UCLA also has a brain um, traumatic something head injury. And I think I was there for a couple of weeks. Um, and then uh, I, I do remember being there. <clears throat> and I remember this woman coming in one day and basically just standing around my bed and we were chit chatting for something. And I don't I mean, who is this woman? And it was, uh, so who turned out that to be was my aunt and Anna had researched this place called CNS, Center for Neuroskills, over in the area that I live. Um, like I, I, as a kid, probably drove by that thing 8,000 times and never knew that's what that was. Uh, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a brain rehab clinic, but there <laughs> is. And so um, I went and they have two homes as well. So I went to live at one of them. Mm -hmm. And again, here's, you know, Anna and Patrice, both of them were near a freeway. Mm -hmm. Okay. But one was more near an off ramp. Okay. So they didn't choose that one. Okay. Thinking maybe I would wander up the off ramp. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was a period of time where, um, you know, Again, I don't recollect a lot of what happened even back then, but I'm told I didn't know why I was there. Wow. Like, I would literally say, what am I doing here? Wow. And, like, is literally, and Anna, this is someone who I went to high school with, she was doing a lot of the looking in after me. Okay. And, and, uh, I would be telling her, why am I here? She's like, well, hasn't the doctor told you you've had a brain injury? Mm -hmm. uh, no, didn't at all. So she literally like, came down one day, had the oversight doctor literally in the room with me. Uh -huh. And wanted the, wanted, she wanted to hear him say that I'm here because I have a brain injury. Okay. And me be in the room too. Okay, okay. But yet still, even after that, I did not know why I was there. That's how your brain just, like, it went through a big deal that day or that night. And so it takes years to come back from that. Uh, well, hold on. There. And, and I'm sure, to your point, uh, so much of this, um, again, usually when this happens, you don't come on the other side to talk about it. You don't know the brain. I mean, how would you know? How would any of us know? Right. Um, it, it's incredible. Well, I, I want to get to the book. At what point did you decide, um, as you and I have talked before we began this, that I first saw a story. Uh, there were other stories written that I had not seen. Um, yeah. I just happened to see an article September of 2022, and that began me reaching out to you. Um, you know, on social media, and, and you know, we had had each other's cell phone numbers, had had lost them over time. Um, at what point did you decide to write the book and, and talk about that process in terms of um, the purpose of trying to get your story out there? It really wasn't me that decided it. Um, the, uh, so um, a friend of mine from the Lions, who was 
he just retired last year named Bill Keenest. Bill Keenest was a longtime media relations director for the Lions, even when I was there. He had come on maybe three or four years before I got there. And so Bill had reached out to uh, his friend, um, uh, Dan Wetzel, with Yahoo Sports. And so Dan Wetzel writes an article, a very generic one, but he mentioned Anna in there. Anna has some quotes and whatever. So a writer named Bill Croyle gets a hold of Anna and says, hey, do you think Eric would even think about collaborating on a book together? And Anna, you know, tells me about it. And she's like, he was very nice, very, you know, no pushy in any way. And it literally took me a while to call him because mm-hmm. I didn't know him. Mm-hmm. And just the idea of doing this, I don't, you know, I was, uh, I don't know. I, it was more than I had ever, it, it's something I never even thought about doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, we started talking over the phone. He doesn't live here. He lives back on the, in the Eastern time zone, back in kind of in Kentucky, but across the river from Cincinnati, I think. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, in any event, um, so we started talking and eventually decided, okay, I think we could do this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's kind of how it came about. And then it kind of took on a life of its own. Yeah. And, um, and I've had, I've had friends now, uh, call me up and say that have known me for year, like 30, 40 years that we've communicated with and i've told him stuff about me and his life to you know vice versa he's like i didn't know half the stuff i was reading yeah and in a good way and uh and so it's just uh it's it it's really had a good response in terms of it's got a little bit of something for everybody in there there's some football stuff there's the relationship i had growing up with my parents a little bit of that there's some dylan griffin who obviously um had his struggles in life and but it's also got the adult version of all that too and um you know as everybody's life kind of takes place over time so too did mine and hence and uh so it's just um um i think it, it's a good life book mm-hmm. that when you read it there's a lot of stuff in there that's probably applicable to most people's lives, yeah. I would say. Yeah. So th- uh, go ahead. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm done. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say that I think that's, um, again, with me, the, the quick skim and, and the things I've kind of read and, and again, learning a little bit about what happened to you before. Um, that was what I, I took away is that this is um, there's, you know, there's there's a carrot there for football fans. Um, yeah. But I think there's so much more. And to your point, so I think that's the thing. And and we're close in age. You're a few years ahead of me, but we're mm-hmm. we're fairly close. And I think that the older you get, um, it's like the the church hymn. We understand it by and you know, understand it by and by. Right. You know, <laughs> um, and I, I think that's what I took from this is in terms of um, there's something here that I think you're going to be as busy as you want to be. Uh, with interview requests, with book signings, with speeches, because I think there's something here because you do have um, a perspective that literally very few people here on this earth have. And mm-hmm. and and you have a very eloquent way of being honest about that and saying, you know, you're not, you know, pointing fingers saying, hey, listen, this is what really happened. Um, how has this been for you in terms of the, the therapy? I mean, I want to ask about physical therapy too, but emotional therapy, spiritual therapy yeah. how has this process um allowed you to evolve it's a great question i think it's really helped um because it's it's helped it's allowed me really to go back and talk through and and get things down that uh give some shape and some some um structure and some sense to life and my life and those around me and you know, we've all got one. And, and so, you know, a lot of people would think, wow, here you've gone from uh, high school to college to pro. How could you be depressed? Well, read this book. That's how. And, <laughs> yeah. and, um, but yet there's also, uh, 
you know, people that know people that are close to them that have anxiety or panic attacks or depression and don't know what to do or say. Mm -hmm. Well, there's stuff in there too. And uh, I'll bet you I'm, I'm probably not the only person who's had um, kind of growing up issues with their parents. Yeah. I, I pretty much guarantee that one. Yeah. yeah. And yet there's a, there's a way there's a, a, a different perspective I have later in life than I had when I was 16, 17. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, I think, um, and there's, there's real people, you know, in this book and real things that do happen to those real people, me included. Yeah. And, um, so I, I, I think, like I said, I think there's some, uh, there's a fair amount of, of humor in it. Uh, it's not, um, terribly dark and depressing. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's sort of, as they say in life, light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, it is. But you're exactly right. Um, we all have stuff. I don't care who you are, what you do, what color you are, where you live, how much money you got. Mm -hmm. whatever. We all have stuff. It uh, doesn't right. matter what your situation is. And I think you you, you put that in a, in a very positive way. Um, physical therapy. I look at you and if I didn't know your story. I wouldn't think that anything had had happened. How long did that process take? Because I know there was some reconstructive stuff yeah. that you had to do. Yeah. Uh, the doctors were fantastic. You're just as handsome now as you were 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything you see here, I, I wasn't necessarily born with. So, okay. Okay. Um, but like I, I had, uh, you know, if you just get football wise, I had to retire because of a couple of neck injuries. Sure. And one I had ended up having surgery for, which basically ended it. And but I've had now two hips replaced, a knee replaced, and um, and all various other. I probably had 16, 17 surgeries, and that's not counting whatever resulted from my suicide attempt. Yeah. And so uh, you know, this what you see here, like this this part of my skull is not mine. Sure. Um uh, and that. The upper part, yeah. The upper part, correct. And so I'm I can't tell you how thankful I am to these ridiculous genius doctors. I mean, crazy. So you talk about not supposed to be here. Anna took me to a doctor appointment one time that the the, the surgeon, that surgeon was there that night. And sitting the night, here, when, you, the night when you came in. Yes. First, okay. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm now this is several months later. Sure. And I'm sitting in his patient room, right? Anna's in there with me. And he's leaning up against the wall and he's asking me questions. And I'm he's over here and I'm talking this way. And I look up and it's like his jaws on the ground. I'm like, did I say something right? He uh wrong. He says, Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. He goes, it's just that uh, people that were in your condition aren't usually here telling me about it later. Yeah. And I guess my like that night, my brain swelled up and they had to close me up uh, and not complete the surgery that night. Wow. OK, so. Uh, so yeah, you're you're right. There are plenty of people that you're going to have this interview with. So I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, very happy to be here. Yeah, and very happy to be telling this story. And I do think that there's a lot of um, a lot of people I think that are going to you know identify with this because this is not some you know my life is so great you know you couldn't possibly attain this. It's right. not that at all. It, as long as every guy. Yeah. And and so I'm a you know family person grew up here locally and uh, so it, there's not a lot of I guess not, there's not a lot of fluff to it I should say yeah yeah no I I didn't think that at all it's a very fast read uh, I would suggest anybody who who gets it just sit down with a with a good cup of coffee beverage and before you know it um, you'll be through it I, I do you've given us a lot of time and I appreciate that I do want to get one more question out of the way what's what's next for for Eric Kramer. I'm glad you asked that. So I've got a couple projects I'm working on. Um, one is a mental health program for kids and families that, okay. uh, so I'll quickly say this. So at 
it's going to start out as an after school program for fourth and fifth graders and then for sixth graders and two different ones a middle school after school program one's an elementary one and picture at that age so you're 10 11 12 and mostly in life okay most of life has been good for you up until this point and so we want to help you as a 10th 11th 10, 11, 12 year old, I help you identify what it is in people, characteristics, I mean, that you would like to be yourself, that you would like to have as a part of you. Okay. Meaning on the positive side, you know, you want to be what a good friend would be, meaning you want to have your friends back or you'd want to step in. You'd want to be a good listener, an active listener, an empathetic one. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't want to isolate somebody away from your friends right so you're going to want to do things that so the idea is that um you you want to learn how to act those out mm -hmm. when the you know you want to we, we'll create scenes that where that does happen right okay and uh then we want to help you create how do you approach somebody like that mm -hmm. to let them know i'm building a home team of people just like you mm -hmm. that in my life I can go to when things are good and when things might not be so good. Right. And these people could be a parent, a teacher, a coach, um, someone slightly older than yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of mentors, of someone slightly older, the feeling that gives them to be looked up to mm -hmm. and, and to give them somebody to be responsible for. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you could over time build that into, you know, through the schools, uh, you know, cause we'll get into the schools too. Mm -hmm. And over time, by the time you start out at 10, by the time you graduate high school, you've been doing this now for eight years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so a good chunk of your life has been dedicated to when you've got issues, good or bad, you've got a group that you can go to. Actually, you'll have a group that will reach out to you, too. OK. Yeah. And so uh, and parents have their own way of getting involved um, and setting goals for themselves, as do your siblings. And so it's a really good program. So that's one thing. And then another is a passing camp. Um, we're going to start out as just passing in the beginning. Um, but I've talked to some fellow former players like me. They don't have to be pros, could be college, but they have they, it, a good thing is for them to be passionate about teaching what they know. OK. And and so we'll have a sponsored camp that will make a video series. And then that video series will be the basis of some mini camps for high school coaches and players, actually the ones that are on their own teams. Okay. And so by the time they get around to having that uh, mini camp on the website, will already be all this video. Okay. And it'll, the playbook will be on there. There's a 3D playbook we'll have. So it, it's going to be a really good experience for the people who not only participate in it to be in that video series part, but also who ends up coming to these mini camps. So it's a uh, very, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm kind of in the stages these last three or four years of kind of putting all this together. And we're kind of right on the cusp from making, turning both of these things into a reality. I, I can tell how important this is to you. Your face lights up. When, when you're talking about this, not that it doesn't otherwise, but even more so. Um, once again, the book is called The Ultimate Comeback, Surviving a Suicide Attempt, Conquering Depression, and Living with a Purpose. Um, Eric, tell people where where they can go get this book. Thank you. It's, you can find it on Amazon. And uh, it's, um, yeah, it, that's the, it, it came out, like you said, earlier in November. And um, uh, it's, it's going really well so far. Thank Good. you. Good. Well, um, hopefully more people hear this. We will do our part to get the word out to as many people as possible, because I get again, we all have stuff and uh, we all need to hear 
uh, from someone who has conquered that, as you say. And it's a very fast read. Eric, um, time has gone by way too fast. I could talk to you for hours, but I don't want to keep you. Um, I, I hope we can keep in touch and uh, we wish you the very best. Anything we can do on our end to help you with this, uh, you know, I'm just a phone call away. I really appreciate that. This has been great so far. And Larry, I really appreciate the time and attention you've given this this book in particular and getting back in touch has been awesome. So thank you. Yeah. 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 I've enjoyed it. And uh, we're, we will, we will, we will renew our, our connection via text message, whatever, and, and maybe a golf or lunch is down the future. Eric, thanks so much. Very good. I love it. Thanks. Larry. Right. Take care. Thank you. Eric Kramer. Once again, he's the former NFL quarterback, 10 years in the NFL, but again, more importantly, the legacy he is um, leaving and about to leave um, far exceeds anything that he did on the football field. The ultimate comeback, surviving a suicide attempt, conquering depression, and living with a purpose. It's a book that's out right now. You can find it on Amazon. And for everyone listening to this, we certainly appreciate your time. Stay with us. We'll continue after a timeout. <laughs> 